But because uh, this May, her feast happened to be on a weekday, we decided to do it today. That's why it's the 1st of June. It is the remembrance of my heavenly mother and at the same time my earthly mother. It happens to be one year since her departure from this temporal realm into the eternal one. May the Lord Jesus, through his infinite grace and mercy, grant all the departed souls his paradise and in the second coming the Father's house in his glory seated at the right hand of the one and only Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Our beloved fathers, deacons, nuns, and faithfuls, both present in the church and those who are watching us through live streaming, it is so good to be back. Thank you. Only one said good to say have you back. <laughs> Man, at least there's one. Um, I'll have a uh, garage sale of glasses um, very soon. They're brand new. <laughs> okay, didn't work. It's so good to be back. Um, I was looking forward to the day. I came in the morning, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to come in the evening. But then the Lord is always good. You know, He uh, always sustains and gives you the strength to carry on even when it is not only difficult but impossible because the Lord is good when it comes to the impossible. When it's possible, He leaves it to us. But when our intellect ceases, can't function anymore, then He says, now it's my turn. Um, the Gospel of today. It is the last chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 21, and verses 1 to 12 inclusive. It is chapter 21 and verses 1 to 12 inclusive. The Lord is trying to teach us a very, very profound message here. The Lord, in this particular chapter, it is his third appearance in 40 days, then went up to heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. This is the third time. And he appears to the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And look at the Holy Spirit, how he puts it so eloquently, so perfectly, so beautifully. And he says, and there was, number one, Simon Peter. Number two, Bartholomew. Number three, Thomas. And number four, the two sons of Zebedee, number five, and other disciples. Wow. Number one, Simon Peter. Number two, sorry, number two, Thomas. Number three, Bartholomew. Number four, the sons of Zebedee, the two sons of Zebedee, number five, and other disciples. Simon Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew, two sons of Zebedee, and other disciples. What happened? Simon Peter came to the other disciples and he said, in our language, hey guys, he gowned. And I said, oh, I don't know. Because they were miserable. They just lost their only hope. They saw him dying on the cross, yet they had hoped that this is the Messiah who is the Savior and the Redeemer of them and everyone who believes in Him. They left everything they knew 
until that moment where Jesus Christ of Nazareth appeared in their life. Everyone was used to their own life. Simon Peter married, going to work as a fisherman, catching a few fish, selling some and bringing some home for cooking and eating. And all the others, they were into that routine. Jesus, this figure, appears out of nowhere. And he comes and chooses them. And he says to them, you are fishermen. I will teach you how to fish. Men this time, not fish. You've been catching fish all your life. I'm going to teach you on how to catch people for me. So everything they had known till that moment is put behind. It is history. Their life changed 180 degrees. They got used to him for over three years. And to be more precise, three and a half. They got used to him and they said, this is it. Finally, the one our forefathers have prophesied and foretold that the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. He will be born in Bethlehem. This is God in the making. God revealed in the flesh. They said we found him. And as they were getting used to this new life, Jesus is taken away from them. He's nailed on the cross, but prior to that, kicked, punched, ridiculed, spat on, whipped, nailed on the cross, fully naked. The most painful thing, and I pray no one goes through it, because this thing can be very fatal, very dangerous. The most dangerous thing anyone can ever go through is disappointment. And especially that disappointment that comes when all your hope has been put on this person and that person that you would never ever have dreamt of one day letting you down, walking away from you or denying you and before you know it, the greatest shock of your life, the person whom you have hanged all your life upon walks away and disappears from you in a blink of an eye. In this disappointment, it is unbearable. Some people, it comes so hard on them, they end up taking their life away. Disappointment. The number one thing disappointment destroys is self-confidence. Now, I want you to pay attention, please. See, these words are very important. The number one thing disappointment destroys is self-confidence. Let me tell you this. If you do not have self-confidence, you cannot keep your faith. I'll repeat it again. If you do not have self-confidence, you cannot keep nor protect your faith. Because why? Why is that? Because when we lose self-confidence, we become afraid. Fear engulfs us. And the moment fear engulfs a Christian, faith disappears. King David said, as long as I had faith, I spoke. The day I lost my faith, I was silent. So what did Simon say to the other disciples? Listen, men, colleagues, friends. I 
am destroyed. I have lost my faith. The one I hanged everything on is dead. The one I believed is the Messiah is dead. The one I left everything behind me and followed him is gone. And this can happen in any relationship regardless what color of that relationship is. It could be husband and wife. It could be a father and a son. It could be a mother and a daughter. It could be siblings. It could be cousins. It could be friends. When they walk away from you, it's very painful. So out of frustration, out of hopelessness, out of fear, not knowing what else to do, Simon said, I'm going fishing. Do you want to come? He wasn't going fishing. When I am so broken, when I have hit rock bottom, am I going to have that kind of a, a heart to go and have fun? I'm destroyed. What fun? When you are so hurt, you don't want to see no one, you don't want to talk to no one, you don't want to hear no one, you don't want to know no one nor anything. Someone lost, just threw a couple of words in the air, not knowing what he's talking about. Let's go fishing. It happened to be all the rest of the disciples were in the same boat. <laughs> in the same situation as Simon. I said, oh, well, we're dead, dead. You know what? Let's go to that big sea. One day we were crossing that sea and strong wind came and big waves came and the water started entering the boat and we were about to sink. You know, maybe we go there and never come back. See, because when you lose that hope, when you lose that faith, you want to die. You don't want to live anymore because there is nothing to look forward to. There is nothing that mean, means anything anymore. So what am I living for? Nothing. Therefore, might as well go. So I'm going to go to the sea in the hope I will never come back. This is my last trip. Lord, you left me. I am hurt. I am disappointed. I thought it was the Messiah. Was my mind playing a trick on me? Or were you the greatest magician far from you that has tricked us so, so big way that we did not realize you were lying? We thought it was you. I don't want to live anymore. So let's go and hopefully die in the Sea of Galilee. All night long, they caught nothing. Of course, because they didn't go fishing. <laughs> what fishing? They're all dead, destroyed. But they didn't know, they didn't know any, anything else. What else to do? Don't we go through those moments? I don't know what else to do. I just want someone to come and tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. Even with the air conditioning, I don't know what to do sometimes. <laughs> Put it up, it's too hot. Put it down, it's too cold. <laughs> so we don't know. So they went all night long just hoping they die. What fishing? And in the early morning, this man shows up at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Isn't it incredible? Isn't it incredible? If you want to know something about the Lord Jesus, let me tell you, my dear friends and my beloved children, the Lord, definitely He comes, but He comes when we thought it's over. When we gave up, when we said it's done, 
When we said there is no more hope, when we said it is the end, I'm finished. The Lord comes. You know why he comes then? Because he wants you and me and all of us to come to this knowledge, to come to this realization, to come to this insight that you see, I don't want you to forget the moment when I put you in that corner and you wave the white flag saying, I cannot do it anymore. And knowing that no one else can do it for you anymore. There is no one that can come to your rescue, neither you nor anyone else whom you had thought they were there, your support, your saviors. When, it, when the Lord put you in that situation, you came to this realization, neither you nor any power can get you out of that impossible situation. That's when God shows up. To make you understand, number one, he exists. And number two, he is the only one that can help you. Next time, when the Lord brings you out of that situation, and you go through another difficult time, don't put your hope on people. You better put your hope on God. And let God help you, whether directly or indirectly, but either way, it is God. Life is a lesson. And so many lessons there are. And we need to learn to understand. Who was at the Sea of Galilee? Simon, Peter, one. Second, Thomas. Third, Bartholomew. Fourth, the sons, the two sons of Zebedee. Fifth, and other disciples. Look how the Holy Spirit, by putting these names and in this particular chronological way, is trying to send us a profound message. What happens when we face the inevitable when we are found lost totally. Simon, Peter. Simon, earthly. Peter, heavenly. Simon, temporal. Peter, eternal. Simon, weak. Peter, strong rock. Simon, born of earthly parents. Peter born of God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it was not the flesh and the blood that revealed this to you, but my Father who art in heaven. Therefore, your name shall be called Peter from now on. You are born of my heavenly Father. But the problem, all of us are Simon, Peter. All of us are having two things, Simon the flesh, Peter the spirit. And whenever Simon surfaces up, I fall. But whenever the rock surfaces up, I stand on my feet, firm and strong. Simon Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew. Between Simon Peter and Bartholomew, the Holy Spirit places the name Thomas. What did Simon say to be Peter? He said, you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. You read that in Matthew chapter 16. You are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. This made him Peter. So who is speaking here? Simon Peter here represents the intellect. Bartholomew, Nathaniel. Now Bartholomew in Hebrew, Arabic, Syriac, Bar means son. So Bar means son. Tholomew happened to be the name of his father. 
So he was the son of Tholomew, and the son of Tholomew was named Nathaniel, who was one of the 12 apostles which the Lord Jesus chose himself. So it was Bartholomew. And what did Bartholomew say to the Lord Jesus? Exactly as Simon Peter said. However, Bartholomew added another thing to what Simon Peter said. He said, you are the son of the living God. You are the king of Israel. This is Bartholomew saying that to the Lord Jesus. You are the king of Israel. So if Simon Peter is the intellect, therefore Bartholomew represents the heart. The king dwells in your heart to reign over your life. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes watch my ways. Bartholomew represents the heart and Simon Peter represents the intellect. And between the intellect and the heart, this short distance yet so difficult to bridge Yet so difficult to bridge between the intellect and the heart. It's a, an extreme short distance. Yet so difficult to bridge and connect. Why? The intellect speaks the language of logic. The heart speaks the language of feelings and emotions. Love. I'm just saying this to make you laugh a bit. Who speaks the language of feelings and emotions? The female. Who speaks the language of lo logic? The male. So the male will come and say, one plus one equals two. It's only logic. I went to school and I learned this, one plus one equals two. That's what the man will say. Every time without fail, one plus one, two. After 100 million years, it's the same result too. The female will come and you say to her, one plus one equals, she will say, I feel it's three. <laughs> Excuse me? Well, this is the way I feel. You got a problem? If you say yes, you will sleep, you will sleep in the street or in your, at your mom's place. If you say, of course I don't have a problem because you're the president. Or if you're in Australia, you are the prime minister there. We just replaced Mr. Albanese. There you go. How can you bridge and connect the logic with the feelings and the emotions? Impossible. Impossible. That's why my beloved, my beloved daughters, please listen. I'm talking in general, men don't talk much. Women never stop talking. When your husband comes back from work, a 10, 12 hour shift, you'll ask him, how was your day? Okay. Anything else? No. You ask the wife, <laughs> who happens to work part-time, only three hours, and you say, how was your morning? She will tell you a story that is never ending. Well, I woke up in the morning and I wasn't feeling well. And then I pushed myself to wash my face and brush my teeth. And then I changed. And then I went. And guess what? Started raining. And I got wet. And it was terrible. I got to work. I said, hello. They didn't look kind of nice people that morning. And then by the time I went on my fifth, 10 minute break to have my coffee, I was dead. The next episode to be continued tomorrow. That's why when you say to your wife, stop talking, you just sinned. <laughs> 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 
Simon Peter the intellect, Bartholomew the heart. How can I bridge these two? Guess what? Someone was placed between them called Thomas. What does Thomas here in this particular passage represent? Suspicion. Because what did Thomas say? The first time when the Lord appeared in that upper room, when the doors and the windows were all shut, Thomas wasn't there. He appeared to the other disciples. Later on, Thomas came, they said to him, the Lord appeared, he said, I will not believe until I see with my eyes and grab with my hands. Suspicion. Why they did not recognize the Lord Jesus standing at the shores of the Sea of Galilee? Because when suspicion enters us, faith runs away, disappears. You cannot discern the Lord without faith. You cannot discern the Lord without faith. And to keep the faith, you need self-confidence. And to keep self-confidence, don't ever expose yourself to disappointment. Therefore, if you ever want to put all your hope on someone, you better put it on Jesus Christ only because he's the only one that will never ever let you down. Never. So what do you do? When you love others, you love them through Christ. You don't love them outside of Christ. Because if you love him outside of Christ, you will be disappointed. You need to love him in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, and for Christ. You see, when suspicion comes, faith disappears. What will happen? Look at the names. Simon Peter, his name is mentioned. Thomas, his name is mentioned. And then, sons, son of Tholomew. And then the two sons of Zebedee and then other disciples. You see, when faith diminishes, my name will not be written in the book of life. I, my name will not be mentioned. And other disciples. The other disciples had names. Why didn't you mention the names, Holy Spirit? He says, because when you lose faith in Christ, you will lose your name from the book of life. Because what gets you to Christ is faith. But, man, don't we like this little word, but. Makes the whole difference. But the Lord is always faithful when we are not. We lose him, he never does. We forget him, he never does. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, he says, if the mother, if the mother forgets, to breastfeed her babe. I will not forget you, says the Lord. And can the mother forget to breastfeed her babe? Impossible. Then it is a million zillion times more impossible for the Lord to forget you. Why are you afraid? Why are you worried? Why are you saying I'm dead meat? Why are you saying, I don't know what the future holds? What do you mean what the future holds? The future is Christ, the present is Christ, and the past is Christ. The one who began the road with you will not leave you halfway. Because Christ is not known to start something without finishing it. He's always known to finish what he starts. Because he is faithful and he's loyal to every promise he made. I will not leave you orphans. I am with you all the days of your life. And until the end of all ages, I am with you. You know when the Lord says, I am with you all the days of your life? Do you understand what the Lord is saying? You see, the problem is, all the days of my life, I am not with him. Sometimes I am, and so many other times I am not. I walk away from him, I sin, I sell him with 30 pieces of silver. 
But even when I sell him, he always purchased me with his precious blood. I am with you all the days of your life. When you are with me, I am with you. And when you are not with me, I am with you. Because the promise is to do with my name and my glory. And my glory I give no one. What I promise I do and I deliver. I never fail. Now you better put your hope on someone that is of this substance. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy and mighty name. Man. What world? What pleasures? Please. Why are you going clubbing? Why do you want to dance with somebody? You better specify. You better dance with this body, not someone. Somebody could be Satan. Could be anyone. So I correct the lyrics which Whitney Houston sang. I want to dance with somebody. It's wrong. I love Whitney Houston. I pray for her always. You need to say, I want to dance with this body, not somebody. Because if you don't dance with Jesus Christ, you're gone. You're gone. You're gone. Ask the Lord to grant you faith and to protect that faith and to preserve that faith and to increase that faith so that we never fall into suspicion. Suspicion drives faith away and the moment faith walks away, fear engulfs. And when fear engulfs, you will never ever be able to recognize Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Never. Even if you see him, even if he talks, you will never know him. And I'll give you a living example from the Holy Bible. When you read in the Gospel according to St. Matthew and in the Gospel according to St. John or in the American accent, John. When the Lord rose from the dead, those women went early morning to bring all the fragrances. They looked, the Lord is not in the grave in the tomb. So, in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, it says they saw this gardener and they've realized it's the Lord. They recognized him. Mary Magdalene, St. Matthew is writing, is documenting. Mary Magdalene, she held his feet and kissed his feet. She held them, touched them and kissed them. The Gospel of St. John says, Mary came to kiss his feet. He said, women, don't touch me. When someone reads these two narratives, they're going to say, oh, look, there is, there is discrepancy. There is something wrong in the Holy Bible. It's not, a, it's not the Holy Bible anymore. It's not the Word of God. You see, someone is saying this and the other one is saying that. Which one is it? No, my dear friend, come to the bishop. He will explain to you. You see, what St. Matthew started, John the Beloved picked on and finished. Half the story is told by St. Matthew. The other half is told by John the Beloved. Perfect. So what happened? The first time when Mary Magdalene saw the Lord, straight away she recognized him, bowed held his feet and kissed his feet. The Lord said to her, go and tell my brothers, I am risen. Go and tell them to come. She went halfway through. Mm, Satan, Satan, that old serpent. I'm gonna send him, send Sherbel to fix him up. Mm. So halfway through, 
Satan comes and whispers in Mary Magdalene's ears without letting her know that it is Satan, thinking it's her head telling her. He said, Mary, are you out of your mind? Do you really think that somebody dies and rises from the dead? Are you sick or are you sick? Listen, you're going to embarrass yourself if you go and tell the disciples, Jesus is risen. They will laugh at you. They will ridicule you. You're going to be embarrassed, ashamed. So what do I do? Go back before you embarrass yourself. Double check that what you saw earlier is true. So Mary doesn't go to the disciples, turns around halfway to double check if it was the Lord she saw or not. John the beloved picks up the story on her way back to the garden. When she came back, she came back without faith. She saw the gardener whom she saw earlier and recognized him as the Lord the next time she came back with that faith, she looked at him, she didn't know it was the Lord. When did she pick up that it was the Lord? When he called her by her name, which she got used to all those three and a half years. You see, when someone is that close to you, they're the only ones they call you in this particular tone, in this particular way. If you are John, others will call you John. But the one you love the most will call you Janjuni, Janajino. So there is a specific style. She looked at him, she didn't recognize him. But when he called her Miriam, oh, oh. I know this voice. I know this tone. No one can tell me it's not the Lord. Because he's the only one that used to call me Miriam in this specific way. No one can copy. She turns and says to him, Rabuli in Hebrew. Rabuli in Hebrew means the teacher. And there is no one else. She bows to kiss his feet and grabs him and kisses him. Says, no, 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 no. You cannot come to me. You cannot touch me. You cannot kiss my feet unless your faith comes back. And the only way you're going to have your faith back, you better go now and don't let no Satan, no one in existence to change your mind. You better go and tell the disciples I am risen. Otherwise, you cannot come to me. So she goes and says to them, I have seen the Lord, he is risen, hallelujah. The faith is restored, Mary is back on track. When we lose our faith, the Lord stands at the shores at the moment where we never ever thought it would ever come. Wow. Because you know what? When you don't, when you never ever thought that moment was going to come and it comes, there is nothing sweeter than that. There is nothing more priceless, precious than that. It surpasses and washes away every pain, sorrow, tear you've shed. Washes away everything. And all the suffering is replaced with joy, happiness, and glory. The Lord is not harsh. The Lord is love. It's called again. The Lord is love. The Lord is faithful. 
He has never forgotten you never will. No matter what. No matter what. He will show up. Sooner or later he will. Slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. Who would have said I would be standing here and preaching again and giving a sermon? Probably you heard this. I received four blows to the head, the back of the head, four. I pray for that young man. I love him from the bottom of my heart. He's my son, he will always be my son. That will never change. And I hope to see him one day because I want to kiss that hand that stabbed me. Kiss it. The Lord is love. The Lord is good. You know, this kind of a talking, and it's not just talk, I mean it. I see, I can't lie to the Lord. I can lie to you, but I can't lie to him. I can't. So the Lord knows it's coming from the bottom of my heart. I have nothing in my heart but love for this young man and those who are like this young man. I pray for their conversion. I pray they see the light and they come to the truth. And if they don't, I wish them all the best. And if they ask for my life, I'll give it for them. I'll give it. Even though I've been going through hell the last six weeks. Unbearable hell. The only one that knows what I've been through is the Lord. It's a hell that I wish it for no one. For no one. Whoever that person is, even if that person is the one who afflicted the greatest harm upon me, I will never wish that hell for them because I can assure you the split second in it, it's like eternity. You're dying, but you're not dying. So it's, this is not a human doing. As a human, there is no way in the world I can forgive, I can love the one who tried to kill me. It's Jesus Christ. We need to open our ears, our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our souls, our whole being. It is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Please see. Stop being blind. It's not me. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. <sighs> but in these six weeks, he never left me. Even though it was unbearable hell. And the reason being, he never left me because I'm standing here now. And talking to you. It's the Lord. <laughs> he made sure I know this 100% clear. No one could have helped me. I was surrounded by wonderful people. I was surrounded by so many prayers and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know you prayed and I know some people even fasted. Little children, angels, all prayed from all over the world. God bless you. I can never pay you back, but I pray the Lord reward you abundantly here on earth. And after a very long and a blessed life here, in the next life, He rewards you much more greater. Received endless letters, emails, messages, phone calls, Postcards, flowers, millions of people worldwide, Christians, non-Christians, and more so, our beloved Muslims.
prayed for me. I love everyone. God blessed them all. Even the atheist prayed for me. I don't know how, but he prayed for me. But they prayed. This is the miracle of Christ. This is what Christ is trying to teach us all. Love. St. Paul calls it the great mystery. What is the great mystery? Love. Why is love the great mystery, St. Paul? Because he says, the Lord Jesus revealed to me through the Holy Spirit that he has united us to him. We became one in him. Now this is the great mystery. How can I, the piece of dust, become united to the infinite God? How can this minute piece of wreck becomes the child, the son of God, and God becomes my dad, my daddy? Now this is love, and it is the great mystery. All you need to do, just take it. Don't try to understand it because you never will. Just embrace it and enjoy it. Those four blows to the head, they were fatal 100%. The knife did not open, it closed on this young man's fingers. And even I think it cut it. But I must say he was good, not bad. <laughs> he gave me, he said, oh, didn't open. I'm gonna give you two more in the neck. Well, the first one was in the eye. Four in the head that never, the knife never opened. And then he opened it and gave me two in the neck. One shallow, the other one deep. Was very close to the main artery. Now that would have been fatal. Missed. I don't know why. Whatever the Lord wants. Whatever the Lord wants. You could say I came back from the dead. Because I was. In the land of the dead, <laughs> I came back. It was hell. That's the land of the dead. Maybe just to give this testimony that Jesus Christ is real. You better believe that. And you better believe that. You better believe that. He's six foot one. When he was on earth, six foot one, long face, tan skin, Jewish, Mediterranean, from the tribe of Judah. He had a brown, crispy hair split in the middle all the way to the shoulders. A very short beard, brownish. 33 years of age after 2024 years. He will never age. You go now and see him, he's still young. And he'll always be young. And when you see this man, you're not going to say, who is this man? You're going to say, who is this mighty God? That's the first impression you will see when you see the man. The Lord will remind you of this word in the next life. He'll say, you remember that old kind of a piece of wreck talking to you? Hey, he was right. Because it wasn't him talking, it was me through him. When you see this man, you say, oh, what a mighty God. But I'm seeing a man, but I'm saying he's God. Because when you see him, he hits you so hard, deep, so deep in the depth of your soul. He penetrates places you have never experienced, never realized. And he will wake you up and he'll say, what a mighty God this is. That's the truth. 
And this was the whole message. This piece of wreck was yelling all these years. It was a message of love, not offense. I'm not the judge, God is. Everyone is free to choose in what to believe and in what not to believe. And we need to respect that. Because I'm not the judge. I cannot say a non-Christian cannot go to heaven, but I can say with confidence, no one gets to heaven without Christ. He's the only way to heaven. And it's not like all roads lead to Rome. No, no. One way leads to God, Jesus Christ. But I can't say an unchristian will not get to heaven because I'm judging. Judgment is for God, not for me. But as a Christian, I need to focus on my Christian life. Where am I in relation to Christ? Before I say anything, I need to look at myself and judge myself as a Christian. And in fact, all these years, if anything, this piece of wreck spoke about Christians more than anything else. I told them all off <laughs> in a loving way. <laughs> Since I'm a Christian, when I talk about Christians, I'm talking about myself. So I'm not judging. You see? I'm not. But the message was out of love, crying out and saying Jesus is the only way. But I love everyone. And whatever they believe in, I respect. I respect. When the, the Lord said, love your neighbor, he didn't specify what kind of a neighbor. He said, love your neighbor. Now, if that neighbor is a Christian, is a Muslim, is a Buddhist, is a Hindu, is an atheist, you need to love that neighbor, period. Anyway, it's all good. I thank the Lord for everything. And we need to thank the Lord for everything. So next time, you, my daughter, you look at your face in the mirror, just like it, don't be upset with it. And my son, don't be miserable. Thank God for what you have. Even if it's a difficult situation, thank God. Let God deal with it. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. It's been six weeks, I haven't spoken. <laughs> Um, believe me when you have the chance to come to the church run for it don't ever say I'm tired I'm busy you have no idea you have no idea what it feels like when you lose that thing you will never appreciate the thing until you lose it I've said it the other day and I'll say it again. It takes hell to appreciate heaven. That's why sometimes the Lord allows us to walk through hell in order to appreciate heaven. King David in Psalm 23, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What is the shadow of death? Hell. The shadow of death is hell. Now, what the Lord is saying, from the dead, I brought Lazarus. So what is more powerful, death or hell? Hell is more powerful than death. You see, if you die, or when you die, I can raise you from the dead, and I did it with Lazarus. He was dead for days. I got him out of the grave. But when you go to hell, that is the impossible, but I am the God of the impossible, even though I walk 
through the valley of the shadow of death and the shadow of death is hell. Saying, King David is saying, even though I walk in hell, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23 verse one. He begins with the Lord is my shepherd. And then he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now Lord, even though I reach the impossible, because you're my shepherd, the impossible becomes possible. Out of hell, you'll bring me to heaven. Fear nothing. Trust in the Lord. He is the mighty God that nothing stands in his way. So you've got a marital problem? Big deal, bro. Financial problem? Cool, brother. Health problems? Hallelujah, brother. Lost the eye? <laughs> Terrible, brother. <laughs> Trust the Lord. And sing a new song. And they sang a new song. What is a new song? A new song that I never sang before. It's the first time I'm singing. When will I sing a new song? When I've been in hell and the Lord got me out of hell, then I learned how to sing a new song. <laughs> Believe me, there is no one else but Jesus Christ. A lot of people will get a shock of their life. <laughs> If they don't believe in the Lord Jesus, it's a problem. But everybody's free. I found, oh, he found me. The Lord has found me. I thank him for that. And I'm indebted to him forever. I don't need to look any further. I don't need to search any longer. And if, I'm saying, which is impossible. But if there is a better God than Jesus Christ, I'm extremely content with the Lord Jesus. I don't need any other God. But I believe and I know there is no other God but Him. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the King that came to rule over every human being's life. But he came to rule over our life with love, not with force, with love. And love is a choice because wherever, wherever there is love, there is freedom. Freedom is indispensable to love. You cannot separate freedom from love. Since love is associated with freedom, therefore, since there is freedom with love, you choose to love, including God. And you choose not to love, including God. It's a choice. Blessed is the soul that chooses to love the Lord Jesus. You'll never regret it. You'll go through hell, but you will always come out triumphant because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Amen. The baby is saying, enough, Bishop, you've spoken for too long. You're getting on my nerves now. I'm hungry. I want to eat. There is no time to sleep. I need to wake up in the morning. So that's it. Thank you, my dear child. Even the little infant baby teaches you to be quiet sometimes. <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads. Ask the Lord Jesus to forgive our sins. Say him in your heart as we recite these words of absolution. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all. Pour, my Lord, the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes. 
and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior in the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith and the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. May the Lord Jesus forgive our sins, our wrongdoings, and bless us all and make us worthy to come forth and receive him in the true body and the true blood, one of the sacraments of the church, one of the seven sacraments of the true church of Christ. God bless you. So good to see you again. And I always look forward to being with you. Let me tell you this for the, and I'll leave you with it. Thanks, Elias. Um, when I'm here, I'm breathing. I go out, I'm suffocating. So the more you come, the more I can breathe. And if you want me to live, you better come. But if you want me to die, it is not the knife that kills. It is the love when it walks away. Amen. So, if you love me, come. This is the Lord saying, not me. Don't love me, love the Lord. So the Lord says, if you love me, you better come because you are my breath. You're my life. You're my children. My only happiness and joy is you. I've left heaven for you. I've left the throne for you. I've left all my glories for you. Nothing is more precious than you. I'll give away heaven for you. And I did from the king to the slave and from the slave to the little termite. I'm a worm, I'm a no man. Psalm 22 verse six, I'm a worm, I'm no man. He went even lower than a slave to a little worm and was crushed on the cross. When you crush the worm, from pain it cries out, but do you hear its cry? No. Step on a worm. You've killed her. You've destroyed her. She's in agony. She screamed, but you can't hear her. The Lord said, I was crushed on the cross and I screamed out of pain, but my father was silent. He didn't hear my cry. Why? Because I went to the lowest of the lowest level just to say to you, I love you more than myself. Will you give me that love back? Every time you come, I, Jesus, regain my breath and regain my energy and regain my strength. What makes you is love and what breaks you is love. So every time you come, the Lord is breathing. Every time you go, the Lord is suffocating. Love the Lord. God bless. Oh, um, just a couple of announcements very quickly. Um, I want to tell you this joke. It's been six weeks. And in advance, my sincerest and deepest apologies. Again, I'm not offending anyone. Please stop stabbing me, okay? <laughs> I'm not offending anyone. Please relax. Um, Mother-in-laws, please do forgive me. It's nothing to do. It's just, it's just a joke, okay? Even if it's real, but it's, it's just a joke. Anyway, this man got married and then... Later on, they had this, germ, this dog. A few, couple of years, this dog one day ate his mother-in-law, killed her. This man had a friend and a very, very close friend to him. So the friend heard about his mother-in-law passing away. He said, I need to go and give my condolences and best wishes. So he goes to his best, to his best friend's house and to his shocking surprise, the house is full of men. He was shocked. He said, 
I've known this man for more than 20 years. I never knew he had other friends. I thought I was his only friend. He never said he had friends. The house is full of men. I'm disappointed now, really. I've got to find out what's going on. Why didn't you tell me? So he goes to his friend and he says, first of all, we're really sorry that your mother-in-law, you know, passed away. He said, but my dear friend, brother, he never told me he had all these friends. What happened? He said, this is the first time I see them. They're not my friends. He said, what are they doing here? He said, they all came asking for the dog. <laughs> I said it from the start, no offense, please don't stab me. <laughs> Relax, okay, it's a joke. Uh, we love our mother-in-laws, don't we, husbands? <laughs> they are wonderful. You know, on a serious note, love everyone in your circle. Love everyone in your circle because when you believe in the Lord Jesus, nothing is coincidental. Everything is planned. So if there is someone in your circle that is being a pain in your life, take that person as your greatest blessings. Because if it wasn't for that person, you wouldn't have made it to heaven. So love everyone. Amen? The dog just died. <laughs> Today was the Feast of the Holy Mother. May the Holy Mother Mary bless you all, be with you and guide you and lead you to her beloved Son who is the way, the truth and the life, the only Savior and the only Redeemer. But the Holy Mother was so faithful till the end that the Lord gave her the ultimate of ultimates. And one day I will tell you about my Holy Mother if the Lord permits. I don't believe, only I know. She's the reason I'm here. Because of the love she had for her son, and she has for her son. For her sake, her son allowed me to be here. She is my, my holy mom, the love of my life. I pray that she 